We're joined now by Hyatt CEO Mark Hoplamazian. Uh, Hyatt, of course, reported earnings last week. And Mark, I want to bring you something that you said on the earnings call, and that is, quote, we don't need to be the biggest in the industry to be the best because we have and will continue to play the game differently. How is Hyatt playing the game differently? Well, I think in multiple, first of all, Katie, nice to be with you. Thanks for having me. Uh, in multiple dimensions, we have uh, really focused very intensively on the uh, high-end traveler. And we've significantly expanded our luxury and our lifestyle and our leisure portfolios over the last five years. Um, part of that has to do with the fact that we've been selling real estate, hotel real estate off and redeploying that capital into acquiring platforms and businesses that have yielded tremendous results. So if you look at uh, 2023, for example, the businesses that we acquired earned roughly twice the amount of money that the hotels that we sold in order to buy those businesses had made. So we significantly expanded uh, shareholder value, but most importantly, we, we, we are applying our core purpose as a company, which is caring for people so they can be their best, into how we differentially care for our corporate customers, our guests, our colleagues, and all of that translates into great results for hotels. So it's a very, uh, it, it's a it's a mutually uh, um, supportive uh, uh, value chain that we've created. Mm -hmm. And uh, over the course of time, we've added a lot of great brands to our portfolio. Well, I want to get to the asset sales, but let's talk a little bit about the high-end traveler a little bit more, because of course you did grow your net rooms, but you also grew fees Per room. We talk about pricing power all the time on this show, but when it comes to that high end, that luxury traveler, do you still have that pricing power? Yes. Um, when you look into the future, um, the data that we got is, is uh, somewhat short term, but uh, our pace, that is forward sales in the fir first quarter for our, our resorts uh, throughout the Caribbean and Mexico are up 11 percent. And our, our forward sales for group business, that is larger convenience and so forth, is up 8% for the, for the whole year. And business transient, uh, which is already above pre-pandemic levels in China and in Europe, is increasing in the United States. And there's tremendous um, ability to maintain and grow pricing. So in every one of those cases, those increases include both some increase in occupancy, but also increases in average daily rates. Mm. So we're seeing continued growth in rate uh, across all of the uh, demand groups that we serve. Well, I found this conversation really interesting because if I take a look at your average occupancy, it's still lower than 2019 levels, but it sounds like you've more than made up for that on the pricing side. That's precisely correct. Uh, some of the areas that it's, that it's been lagging the most is in our large convention hotels, where we are four to five points of occupancy below where we were pre-pandemic. Um, so you're absolutely right. Total revenues are up, and it's largely driven, been largely driven by um, rate. I think uh, we will see a more balanced increase in 2024 than we had before. Our our own situation is that we grew our revenue per available room in 2023 by 17%, and so. Our, out, our outlook that we uh, mentioned on our earnings call last week was up 3 to 5% for 2024, which sounds dramatically lower than the 17%. But remember, that's off of a, uh, off of a base that's much higher mm. going into the year. So it's continued momentum, positive momentum across the board and across the globe. Well, Mark, I'm curious, do you see returning back to those 2019 levels or has the nature of travel, especially when it comes to things such as conferences, for example, has the world fundamentally changed there? Uh, no, I, we, we are already above 2019 levels in revenues uh, for group travel. And I think that will I, I think our occupancy opportunity and further rate opportunities will leave us ahead of 2019 levels in group for sure in leisure. We're operating somewhere between 20 and 30 percent higher than where we were pre-pandemic. And business transient will fully recover in the United States. It's already above pre-pandemic levels in Europe and China. But I, I have every confidence and we're seeing positive momentum in individual business travel in the United States this year to date uh, in the first quarter. So it gives me encouragement to know that we're, we're on our way to having full recovery and, and, and really uh, not just getting back to 2019 levels, but actually building beyond those. Well, I have to say, at least in Miami, it feels like there's a conference every single week, especially in February. But 
that's a different conversation. Let's talk about what else we learned last week in Hyatt's earnings. Of course, it seems like Wall Street was particularly jazzed about the 80% sale of the Unlimited Vacation Club business. Uh, I want to talk about why, though. Does this necessarily alter your strategy, or was this more about simplifying your disclosures? Um, well, you're obviously paying a lot of attention. It was about simplifying our disclosures. It's a great business that's integrated into our all-inclusive business. The club itself, uh, <laughs> excuse me, is uh, provides tremendous benefits to its members, and uh, it's been growing at a very healthy rate over the last uh, well, over the last five or six years. Um, so it, it really is a, a great additive uh, value for the members of the club. It's also great for hotel owners who have um, who, who invite those uh, members into their club it, into their hotels. Um, and they are high spending and very frequent traveler, travelers. The issue with this business is that it's a subscri subscription model, which has accounting associated with it that has a lot of deferrals in it. So you, you recognize 100% of the expenses up front and the revenues get amortized over time, even though you've collected the cash. Mm. And we thought we, we've explained it uh, many times, but there's no substitute for simplifying it. And that's actually what we did through that uh, transaction. Well, Mark, I appreciate you explaining it again. And I only have about a minute left with you, but I am really curious to get your thoughts on this narrative of revenge travel, revenge spending. That's uh, been used to explain a lot of what we're seeing in the entire travel industry. Is that what you're seeing as well? And if that's the case, would you expect it to peter out from here? Yeah, I think it's, I would I would say we can retire the word revenge travel and, and talk about the fact that People have so connected with uh, the feeling of being able to be mobile and and uh, and going out and experiencing different things. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, I'll just give you one example, which is quite amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, when Taylor Swift uh, did her three night three uh, concert stay in Chicago, the city exceeded its its peak hotel revenues by a wide margin in the entire history of the city. And this, so this Taylor Swift effect is absolutely real. Why? That's not revenge travel. That's like seeking out a, a great experience that people will say, yeah, I'm going. Yeah, I understand it's going to cost me a lot of money, but what an experience I'm going to get. And I think that's true in leisure. I think it's true on extending business trips. I think it's true in convenings. I think our meetings, our corporations are really, corporate customers are really leading into unique experiences during their meetings. So it's really going through going towards more experiential and prioritizing that and mm -hmm. being willing to spend for it.